what's up guys welcome back to the strong sisters youtube channel as many of you are aware ruminants specifically cows have really been the scapegoat for our environmental problems that we are facing so cows are viewed as a problem due to their burps their farts they're destroying the planet however when managed properly ruminants can play an incredible role in repairing the health of ecosystems improving soil health improving the soil biology so i decided to invite dr richard teague to come onto our channel to discuss the science behind holistic management so proper management of ruminants and cows to improve soil health Dr. Richard Teague has produced a number of publications throughout his research career that really outline how this is working scientifically, how when managed properly, cows are repairing ecosystems, increasing the amount of carbon sequestered into the soil. So I decided to break up this conversation with Dr. Teague into two parts. In today's video, part one, we review the science behind adaptive multi-paddock grazing AMP grazing, also called holistic management, which is different than rotational grazing. And then make sure you check out part two, which covers some of the criticisms of regenerative ag and Dr. Teague's responses to those criticisms. So I really think highlighting the science behind how this is all working is really important right now in this current climate where you have people like Impossible Foods who are trying to end animal agriculture when in fact, Proper management of ruminants, including cows, is vital and necessary in order for us to improve ecosystems and improve soil health. So this information and this science is really important to get out into more of the mainstream. So if you guys could make sure you like and send this video to family and friends and make sure you subscribe to our channel. All right, I hope you guys enjoy this conversation. Dr. Teague, thank you so much for coming on the channel to discuss how ruminants actually play a vital role in repairing our soil and climate issues. This is a really important message to share right now when there seems to be such a big push to end animal agriculture by things such as Impossible Foods, where the CEO said his mission is to completely replace animals in the food system by 2035. So really appreciate you taking the time. Um, so I heard you recently retired but please share with us a little bit about your academic career, which departments you were in, and really how you got into regenerative agriculture and adaptive multi-paddock grazing. Well, I have arrived in the States in 1991. I was recruited from South Africa because of my knowledge on regenerative grazing. And um, I've been working as a researcher in at Texas A&M Research at one of the outlying stations um, where much of my work has been conducted, but in the last 15 years, we've been working right through North America, right up into Canada, as far north as Edmonton, and uh, more recently uh, uh, to the east of the Mississippi, looking at um, the consequences of managing ranches in the con conventional manner of, of set stocking and uh, set light stocking compared to the, the grazing that I had learnt about in Africa, which is adaptive multi-paddock grazing, involves short periods of grazing with long periods of rest, and that is shown to have multiple benefits for the ecosystem services that make everything work. That's great. Um, so I think if we could just set the scene for the audience a little bit, and let's kind of start with a review of industrial agriculture practices and how it has really destroyed our ecosystems here and has, a neg has had a negative consequence on our soil health. A lot of us have known about this for quite a while, but three years ago, the UN had the year of soil and it was abundantly clear um, through the, the voice of all the world's leading soil scientists that if we carried on farming and ranching the way we were, we would be destroying the functions of the soil and we wouldn't be able to produce food from soil within 60 years. That's a very short time period. Um, so we set about looking uh, through uh, NRCS, for instance, Natural Resource Conservation Service, to find out which farmers were farming in a manner that had improved the soil while they were, and, and to build an increased profitability based on improving the soil. And uh, so we followed up on the leads uh, given by them 
And that has been the foundation of our research. And without exception, the people following regenerative agriculture, getting away from industrial agriculture, had by far the highest levels of soil carbon and soil health generally. So in general, um, industrial agriculture practices seem to take more than they give back. And from my understanding, um, industrial agriculture practices kind of destroy the ecosystems and destroy the way that plants naturally and normally get their nutrients, which is through microbes in the soil. And so when we kill off that relationship between the plant roots and the microbes, of course, it will require synthetic inputs because we're not getting nutrients the way that it was naturally done for thousands, millions of years. Um, and so it just seems like we're, we're on this hamster wheel, this treadmill where every year requires more and more synthetic inputs and at the cost of our soil health. So I think it's pretty clear to the audience um, that we're at a really important transformative place right now where we have to make these bigger decisions if we want to have a sustainable food system in the future. And it seems like there's kind of two groups of people. There, there's one group that thinks that we'll be able to solve this problem. Oh, if we run out of soil, it's okay. We have hydroponics, we have technology where we can 3D print meat, we can create our food in a lab. And then obviously this regenerative agriculture movement that says, no, the only way to produce nutrient dense food in a way that supports our climate and the health of our climate is through repairing the health of the soil. And so I think we're at this really important place right now because we still do have soil left to create food, but who knows where we'll be in, like you said, 60 years. And so it just seems like, <laughs> it's this let's solve all of our problems with technology or hey let's return back to nature and work with nature and let biology do its thing um so in terms of the regenerative side and getting more getting more carbon back in the soil returning the biology back to the soil can you uh speak on how cows help us do this like how ruminants can help us improve soil health and what you have discovered through your research? Okay, that's a very good question and you're quite correct in what you've said. So we need to go back to identify the biological causal mechanisms of what has caused this degradation and what we have to remedy in order to reverse it. So in all agriculture, particularly in the drier areas, the biggest limiting factor is not the amount of rainfall you get, but the amount of rain that actually gets into the soil to keep the ecosystem ticking, to grow the crops, grow the grass, etc. So by using tillage and inorganic fertilizers, that actually decimates the key element that improves soil infiltration, and that is soil fungi. The fungi form a network that is very dense and can access areas that plant roots can't, and they connect to the plant roots and make water and nutrients available that wouldn't otherwise be available. By managing, by tilling the soil, by putting down inorganic fertilizers and using pesticides, we've almost entirely eliminated fungi and, and the, the other uh, microorganisms that actually facilitate water getting into the ground. So as soon as you manage to reverse that by encouraging cover and using uh, organic means, you. The cattle are very important from a point of view of recycling nutrients and the poop they put in the ground is obviously biological. So it enhances the, the uh, soil microorganisms and the dung beetles and things like that, that immediately improve the infiltration into the soil. At the same time, as soon as you, you get more moisture into the soil, you get more plant growth and the plants grow equally below ground as well as they do above. And the below, the below ground um, uh, root material in that, there's a turnover of that. And it creates organic matter that then builds the soil organic matter. So as soon as you've got more pl plant growth by getting more water in the ground, then the organic matter improves. Now, organic matter holds more nutrients to it um, than soil particles do. So as you increase the amount of organic matter, the amount of nutrients through the biological uh, recycling process of uh, decaying plant and animal matter that goes back into the soil, uh, you increase the amount of fertility of the soil. 
And those effects are huge. And all the, the grassland ecosystems where most of our cropping takes place, they evolved under native herbivores, a great number of mixed species of native herbivores that didn't graze in one place all the time, they moved around. Because as soon as to avoid predators, they have to bunch up. And if you bunch up, they all poop on the ground there. So they, and that spoils it. And there's a smell there and they want to move away from that. So that is the natural order of how things evolve. So the grazing that we've been investigating actually mimics that. And we have um, <clears throat> documented that. So you will get, get on later on to um, uh, how research needs to be done to actually find these things out. Yeah, you, you bring up a, so many great points there, but I think like first and foremost, like who wants to live in poop, right? No one wants to live in their poop. So of course they're gonna move on to the next one. Um, I one of your recent papers, I, I saved a segment from it. You said, in a global analysis, Sanderman et al. 2017 found that the largest soil organic carbon losses coincide with cropping regions, but grazing, especially in arid and semi-arid regions that are globally more extensive, was responsible for at least half of the total soil organic carbon loss. So I think that this is a really important point that your research um, points out is that Grazing, grass-fed is not grass-fed is not grass-fed, as Dr. Provenza likes to say. Um, continuous grazing can be incredibly harmful to the soil. It's almost like you're having cows graze on a golf course. And like you just said earlier, the amount of biomass of the plants that you see above ground is representative of the amount of biomass you see below ground. So when we're continuously grazing, we are destroying, we're not, we're harming the root systems below ground that is allowing us to sequester more carbon, create these homes for micro, bio, uh, for microbes and fungi. Um, and so I think it's really important to distinguish that you've, you've spent a lot of time doing this with your papers that continuous and overgrazing, which is this concept of just having your cows stay in the same area for a long period of time being selective with which plants they choose and overgrazing can be extremely detrimental to the uh, root systems and soil organic carbon as well. Um, so can you distinguish between, there's a lot of terms out there, continuous grazing versus rotational grazing versus holistic grazing versus what you have defined or the, the, the best definition as adaptive multi-paddock grazing. Can you kind of distinguish between those practices? Because they're not all equal to improving soil health. Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, to begin, what we call amp grazing, adaptive multi-paddock grazing, is synonymous with holistic grazing. So all these people uh, savory termed that, but because the scientists were so uh, vitriolically antagonistic towards them, we used a different term for the same thing, uh, just so people wouldn't, um, be biased right from the, from the beginning. So under continuous grazing, the animals graze where they want to. And they tend to go for the shorter stuff that's been grazed before because it's, it's green, it's the most recent growth. Uh, and the other stuff around that grows up fairly tall um, and has less nutrient density. Uh, because they keep it short for a long time, uh, droughts which are endemic to all grazing areas happen quite frequently as soon as that happens, all the plants with shallow roots can't make it because they haven't got deep enough roots. So they die and they leave bare ground. The bare ground has reduced infiltration capacity. So the water runs off there, taking with it soil and organic matter. So there's an immediate degradation step that happens there that unless you actually reverse that, uh, just continues to expand. And the heavier the, the continuous stocking, the more quickly that happens. So what adaptive management does is it grazes for a short period of time, a matter of a day to a few days, and then gives a very, very long recovery period, which allows the roots to go down as deep as they can. And that immediately um, covers the ground better than, than grazing off very short which um, as soon as the ground is covered, it, it, um, it's a much more healthy environment in the soil for the microbes to thrive. So the deeper soil roots 
and the more um, more viable and greater biomass or soil microbes increases the the functions of improving the infiltration of the water. It improves the nutrient cycling, and it also improves the species composition. It makes for greater biodiversity, and there is uh, an effect. The, the more biodiversity you have, the species complement each other to create a much better environment uh, and a more stable ecosystem. So the amp grazing provides that to get away from the previous degradation that occurred. So the people, uh, a lot of academics will say, well, all you've got to do is decrease the cattle numbers. No, or if you decrease the cattle numbers, you just de decrease the area that they are grazing into the ground. Um, and you, you're never allowing um, a, a respite from grazing on those areas. And that is what's necessary is the adequate recovery of those areas. Plus you need to spread the grazing over the whole area in order to diminish the negative effects at any particular point. AMP grazing does that. And independent research uh, by a whole bunch of German researchers has indicated this very well. They, they worked in Namibia and uh, in Argentina, and they've got absolutely superb, and in, the, in the highest journals published, they, they uh, document that the greatest improvements happen with the greater number of paddocks because you can keep a very short grazing period. It can either be heavy or light, depending on the needs of the plants at that time. And then with adequate recovery, all the right things happen and you enhance the capture of sun, sunlight, essential to drive the system. You improve the hydrological function, you improve the nutrient cycling, and of course, biodiversity increases. So those are things that we have documented in, in very decent journals. Um, and, you know, both in dry areas, like in South Dakota, here in Texas, and our recent work across the, the east of the Mississippi has uh, determined how much better than conventional grazing they are. For example, the AMP grazers uh, put much more carbon in the soil than the, um, the conventional grazers. They also had higher nitrogen levels, and the interesting thing is that the amp grazing, the nitrogen levels were biologically determined by healthy microbes. The conventional guys were putting on fertilizer, N, P, and K, okay, and they ended up with less available nitrogen to the plants because they decreased, as soon as you put inorganics and pesticides on the soil, it decreases the biological function. The amp grazing, conversely, actually enhances the biological function and suddenly, the, 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 the pre-modern um, human uh, decimation of soil function has actually been reversed. And we're finding this wherever we study it, from here to New Mexico, drier country, from here to South Dakota, to drier country, from here up into Canada, colder, shorter season. Um, some of the most remarkable increases in carbon have occurred up in North Dakota and Saskatchewan that we've measured. And now that we, we're measuring in a very productive environment uh, to the east of the, of the Mississippi, we're getting gigantic amounts of carbon being put into the soil. And that is reflected by independent work um, uh, reported by uh, scientists from uh, Colorado State. So the benefits are there. Yeah, so I think <clears throat> in summary, I like to think, I, when I first got into this space, I kind of just thought, oh, it's just rotational grazing. Like you have this preset plan where you divide your field up into paddocks and you just rotate through those paddocks. And I think that I was definitely naive at that point. I'm still very naive on all of these things and have a lot to learn. But um, since I really uh, like gained a lot of respect for these regenerative farmers who are implementing AMP, adaptive multi-paddock grazing, because it's more of an observation and a skill where one is able to observe what's happening with the soil, adapt, AMP, adaptive multi paddock grazing, adapt their schedule and see how much the cows are eating. And Greg Judy likes to do the take third, take a third, leave two thirds. So let the cows graze the top third and then leave two thirds at the bottom and rotate it through. And I like to compare it to like working out. If you work out every single day, your muscles are gonna, won't have time to recover. If you work out your biceps maybe two times a week, 
they'll maybe have time to recover and grow back bigger and stronger. It's all about finding that optimal recovery period where your muscle fibers can grow back bigger and stronger than before. Cause if you just work out on sore muscles, you're just causing like more harm, more inflammation and things like that. So that's kind of how I like to think of it. It's, it really is a, an amazing skill that these amp successful amp grazers have. And I really have a lot of respect for them. Uh, you, you raised a very important point that I neglected. You asked the question about rotational grazing. The difference between rotational grazing and amp grazing is the length of grazing and the length of recovery. Rotational grazing, um, the, the, the soonest they move is after a week, usually a, a fortnight or a month. And then they come back after uh, a, a very reduced recovery. So you've got longer period of growing, of grazing, with a shorter period of recovery. And that's why it doesn't have the same results as the amp grazing. So if, if you graze um, rotationally in a rotation system, not an amp system, where you've got a lower density of grazing, the animals still choose and hit the, the, the preferred spots heavily before you actually move them on. So you get some recovery when they come back again after say a month's uh, recovery, which is the kind of usual thing that they would do. But that is not adequate because of the amount of time that they've spent on those heavily grazed patches. So it's a move in the right direction. But as one of my um, holistic management uh, compatriots tells me, um, what they're doing is rotationally overgrazing and underresting. So that is a distinction between them and amp grazing. Good call. Good call. Okay. Regenerative ag is definitely. Um, being heard about more widespread and it's being talked about both good and bad. And so if we could kind of talk about some of these criticisms. So I'll bring up one um, by Dr. Brisk. So let me bring this up. So the savory method cannot green deserts or reverse climate change. So this is a response to Alan Savory's TED talk um, a number of years ago where they discredit the potential of uh, regenerative agriculture and holistic management. So when you are when you receive um, criticism from these types of papers, how, how do you typically respond or what do you think the shortfalls of, of these uh, counter arguments are? Okay, so in the same journal, um, I wrote a letter pointing out the shortfalls of Brisky's understanding of the subject. And basically all the research that he quotes um, does not take into account that the larger the area being grazed, the more heterogeneous the impact on the land. The animals, even though they've got a very, very large area, they won't graze evenly over the whole area. They select certain spots and graze them into the ground. The research has worked on very small areas, so they don't pick up that difference, but it's very evident on any commercial scale ranch. The other point is in range ecosystems, they're generally dry and changes in factors like soil uh, carbon change very slowly. And most research is done over three, four, five years. And that is not nearly long enough in these dry areas to actually pick up any changes. So it's what they call an error two in science. In other words, the difference is there, but you just didn't pick it up. If they had carried on and done their research, you see, we insist in our area, which has got moderate rainfall, of having treatments down for at least 10 years before we know we're going to pick up a difference. If you go dry like New Mexico, you have to go for 20 or 30 years to pick up a difference, which we've done. However, the converse of that is if you go across the Mississippi, in three years, you get huge differences because of the extra rainfall. So the, the, the length of time research has been conducted but probably the most critical issue is it, the people who have managed to have the best results um, have had training that makes them superior managers. They know how to manage and, and they know how to look for early signs of, hey, this isn't working. I can see that this area here has actually got less litter cover, i.e. more bare ground this year than it did last year. So they change their management. That is the the key of adaptive management. Researchers don't do that. And they don't manage for the best outcomes with a given tool. Whereas the amp grazers 
we've done, we've worked with ranchers who've shown how to make it work. And they have 100% interest in making it work as well as possible. So they make it work as well as possible. Researchers don't do that. And if the researcher is inherently biased against it, he's definitely not going to make it uh, managed as well as it can be. And that's exactly what's happened. So those are just the major reasons why. And uh, we've located these differences from here up to Canada. <clears throat> when we look across the fence at conventional, light or heavy grazing comp compared to the amp grazing, uh, the amp grazing has come out ahead in 99% of the cases. So I'm gonna share one more PDF. So this was the infamous grazed and confused by the Food Climate Research Network. Um, I think this was published when 2017. Um, and I, I read through some of this and basically what I think the summary of what this says is that they're regenerative ag and this amp great, they don't even use the term amp grazing. They say rotational grazing and holistic management. Um, it's over talked about. It's not, it's not gonna be able to live up to what people say it's gonna achieve. And I did a like command F to search through this document for any of your science articles or Dr. Roundtree's science articles and none of them show up. And you touched on this earlier um, where you reached this point in your research career where you saw all of this negative feedback from people who are talking poorly about Alan Savory and you had to come up with a different term besides holistic management. So AMP grazing, adaptive multi paddock grazing and this, this grazed and confused document, um, they do kind of like a literature search. And so I, I went to grad school and I did a literature search. And the way you run these literature searches is you're trying to get an idea of all the research that's been published in a certain area, combine all, make a conclusion about all the evidence out there. And the way that you do this is through keyword searches. And I think sometimes you can miss complete, areas in a research field because you didn't use the right keyword search. And from what I can tell from this FCRN Grace and Confuse article, they must have just used holistic management keyword search and they did not use the AMP grazing. And so they completely missed all of this other research that's out there. And that's a huge issue because this is a really big document that makes a lot, um, I think that it, uh, like a lot of policy leaders will be reading this and things like that. And so am I correct in that um, understanding? You're absolutely correct. So I'm, my answer to that is we live in a world where scientific knowledge has been grossly misrepresented by political viewpoints. And while one has to admit that a lot of the grazing in the grazing world, a lot of damage has been caused by improper grazing, <clears throat> the scientific method dictates that no matter what your hypothesis is, you should always be looking for, not just be aware of or take into account, be looking for deviations from your hypothesis. And then you don't just dismiss it out of hand. You find out, well, why have they arrived at this conclusion versus the existing um, knowledge base? And as soon as you do that, you look at reasons why, and you go to people who've actually succeeded you realize that there are very different things at play that have to be taken into account, which we've just been discussing. So this particular group, I know I've met many of them. I've, I've met most of them at the, uh, um, the May um, Paris conference on all these things. And they don't look for the counter view and try and understand the counter view. They just use existing literature only to actually forward their viewpoint without taking into account the other material that's actually been published. Now, part of the confusion uh, is that using amp grazing, people have not realized that it's the same as holistic and they are searching for holistic management. So we're busy correcting that at the moment. Um, but by using amp grazing, we've made enormous strides in getting everything published in decent journals. We now, uh, my latest, the, the, the earlier paper that, that you uh, quoted, uh, we, we state categorically that holistic management and amp grazing are synonymous. So uh, that you have to take that lot into account. 
Plus, there's a whole lot of people who are anti-cattle for um, other reasons. And they don't, they don't, you, I, when I went to school, they taught us, we had a debating society <clears throat> and every week we would have a different topic that we had to address. And we, we debated in pairs, uh, my pair plus the other people's pair. And week one, the one pair had to argue the, the case for, and the other pair had to the, do the case against. The following week, you switched those around. So both parties were forced to look at the other viewpoint and present it. That is what people do not do anymore. And how else are you going to arrive at what's really happening than by going through a rigorous process of looking at both sides of the equation? And that is what's required, is a rigorous look at both sides of the equation. We are coming out now, we had 20 scientists in our 14 discipline uh, across the Mississippi study. We coming, those are coming out now that they, with the journals now. When that comes out, uh, people will see that there's a substantial uh, amount of, of information now available about amp grazing and its benefits um, from independent schools. You know, uh, A&M was just one of the, the, the schools involved, Colorado State, Michigan State, um, all over the place. So there's some heavy scientists that have got involved in this and our results are extremely promising. Yeah, I think that one of the biggest um, criticisms of Regen Ag is there's no science to support it. And I can confidently say now that's false. There is, you just don't know where to look. And you have to use the keyword search adult adaptive multi-paddock grazing and look at the research from Dr. Richard Teague, yourself, Dr. Jason Roundtree, Dr. Paige Stanley, Dr. Wayne, Dr. Gosnell, there's, there's plenty of researchers now producing these uh, research studies demonstrating the power of ruminants in repairing our ecosystems and repairing the health of soil when managed properly. Um, so I would like to just cover one of your um, research papers. There's a ton out there and we would not be able to cover all of them in this conversation. Um, but I, I think that you brought this up earlier. It takes 10 to 20 to 30 years sometimes to see these huge positive changes in the soil and things like that. And so that presents a challenge for researchers such as yourself because your career in academia may not be that long. And so from reading through the, the literature, I have recognized that you guys, many of you use models. And of course there are potential downsides to models but it really is like the best option that one has. Can you talk a little bit about um, your, how have you conducted your studies? Has it been a combination of observation from going to these fields that have organic matter to using data collection from there to develop models? What has been um, some of the approaches that you've taken? Excellent question again. <clears throat> so to begin with, um, we knew through our experience and my experience goes back to when I was 15, that was nearly 60 years ago. Um, that regenerative grazing works if it's managed properly. So we then had to show in publications, now that hadn't appeared in publications, we had to show in respectable journals uh, that there was a difference in outcomes given the right amount of time and the right amount of, of management um, in regen. And that's what we've done. Through the NRCS, i.e. an independent group, we said, who's got the highest soil carbon and gone and studied them versus their neighbors, either light continuous or heavy continuous grazing. We had to make sure that they had followed the protocols of uh, AMP grazing, holistic grazing adequately to represent that particular way of grazing. So it, it means, unlike in other science, you don't do things exactly the same on the AMP area as you from one region to another, or even from one farm to the other. You manage it for best results according to what happened on that ranch. And because even though ranches were um, so a couple of miles apart, um, you know, we had, we had the paired ranches um, and then the other pair would be 10, 15 miles away. The rainfall on those two things is different. We got a 35,000 acre study that we were on. We had 35 rainfall samples on there that we, we measured the rainfall every single day. And it was never the same from one end of that 
particular ranch to another. So you've got to take into account that a person is managing for what's happening on their place now. That is correct management. And unless you're doing that, you're not representing that treatment really well. So the first thing was to find out, okay, is there a difference after X number of years? And we're coming up with all over the place now. Yes, there is a difference. So that's the first phase of research. The phases of research are observation, hypothesis testing, and then re revamping the hypothesis to take care of what you learn. And it's, it just goes on and on and on. So that's the first one. The next one now is to say, right, we found these differences, but they weren't exactly the same at each one of these places. Why? That's the next phase of research. Now you can get into the more detailed research where you've got better control, but you still have to work in the area that's under commercial production and that has followed the right kind of management, i.e. go back to the same places and ask the same questions there in a little bit more detail. That's what we're entering into now. So the role of, of modeling in this. Um, I did my PhD in a science faculty at one of the better universities in South Africa. It was a botany and microbiology one. And a model, a, 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 a simulation model, is a representation of your knowledge to date, i.e. a written mathematical hypothesis, which you then test. You then say, okay, we've measured these things in the field. Um, does the model say the same thing? If the model doesn't say the same thing, the model's wrong, not the research is wrong in the field, okay? So then what we found is that the, the heavy continuous versus moderate continuous versus amp grazing, the models that we wrote to be able to um, evaluate them were very accurate compared to the field results. We got independent models written by the ARS on watersheds. The whole watershed response, it's based on the actual um, soil composition of a particular farm. And we've, we've asked the model to say, if you manage like this with heavy continuous, light continuous or amp grazing, what does the model tell us about the hydrology of that whole watershed area? And those have been very accurate as well, all published. Um, so you, your model tells you how good your understanding is. But we've reached the point now where people are saying, yeah, this is good. You've shown us it works, but we need to know what happens in every part of the country. So those models, like the, the ARS model that do the watershed modeling, that use the existing Sergo uh, soil database, we can now do those same things right around the country. We can do those simulations. We've just got to find people in each location. Um, for instance, we've just done one up in North Dakota, as well as in, in uh, West Texas, where we've used the same model to check against farm soil results that we've picked up in each of those two locations. And that model has shown accurately in both North Dakota and Texas um, that, yes, that there's substance to your hypothesis. So that's a continuation. And now we're going to go back. See, our, our work from South Dakota, uh, where it's drier, people say, well, you didn't get um, a, a significant response to amp being better than continuous grazing on some of those soils. So that supports the hypothesis that your response or in increasing soil carbon is going to be closely related to how good the inherent infiltration capacity is of the different soils in your farm. All the soils that were at the bottom of the slope and had quicker infiltration, which was usually about four times quicker than the other soils on the farm, those are the ones where we got a significant response. On the other side, we got a 10% response. In other words, close to being significant. So it was also happening, but it wasn't quite significant. So what does that tell us? That the same thing's happening, but we're gonna to have to follow it over another five or 10 years to see if, okay, is it now significant? Yeah. So that's the progression of the science that we've been practicing. I think that that's something that I haven't really um, understood. So I, I appreciate that explanation that the, length of time required is going to vary all throughout the country and it's going to depend on your soil quality um, and so i think that's a really important thing to consider so along that model discussion um, i really enjoyed this paper i'm going to bring it up here that you published um, the role of ruminants in reducing agriculture's carbon footprint in north america 
And uh, in this paper, you postulate five scenarios for land management changes to reduce and ultimately reduce, um, sorry, reduce and ultimately reverse greenhouse gas emissions associated with our current industrial agriculture um, practices. And if I'm going to bring up figures one and two, I think that these are really powerful. And so I, uh, if you could talk briefly on these. So just your summary or your uh, one of the statements in this paper is the application of these regenerative conservation practices in crop and livestock production systems to just 25% of the land results in substantially less net carbon emissions than reducing livestock by 50%. So there's these group of people out there who are saying, let's reduce the livestock and that'll reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. These figures you're saying, no, if we instead manage the livestock better and do this in just a small percentage, we can see more carbon sequestration um, and improvement than reducing the livestock. So I think that these are really powerful figures. If you can talk briefly. Let me walk right. through them briefly. Okay. So on, on the, the uh, Y axis there, you've got, you've got uh, scenario one, two, three, four, and five. Mm -hmm. So you, on the left-hand side, you've got net greenhouse gas emissions. That's a difference between emissions and the amount being sequestered. So the green, uh, is the amount sequestered by the animals, which we know that they they not sequestered, the amount um, produced by the animals. The red is the amount produced by soil erosion and all the, the, the fertilizer and stuff like that that carries um, a carbon footprint. Um, and then the fertilizer and cropping is the blue. So scenario two is if you reduce the livestock numbers by 50%. And you'll see the green on scenario two is a half of what it is there, but it doesn't change the situation at all. Something else needs to change. So scenario three is the, the, the current, not the reduced amount of livestock grazing, but taking into account that the animals producing beef, for instance, um, they sequester more carbon when they're on grazing pastures, which is for most of their lives. They produce more to offset the emissions that they make. So you've got a net um, soil improvement uh, in, in point three there uh, in the green. And the, um, the, the farm soil production is diminished because as soon as you've got ground covered by perennial pastures, you radically reduce the amount of soil loss and erosion. And the fertilizer and cropping is reduced because you can use the cattle uh, intelligently managed to actually improve the, um, the fertility of the soil and reduce the amount of damage, soil damaging uh, fertilizers. So that's with 25% um, of the area devoted to regenerative grazing compared to the current situation. Scenario four, is where you have 50% of the, the area um, under regenerative grazing. And so you see the net effect is um, the amount sequestered um, in shown in green there greatly exceeds the total emissions of the whole of agriculture. And the, the totally unlikely scenario of 100% regenerative grazing gives you scenario five. It's not going to happen, but it just shows you the sensitivity and what potential there is in using regenerative grazing in an uh, intelligent. Uh, you, you've got to be goal oriented if you want to achieve a goal. If you manage specifically to uh, diminish the soil degradation and to build the soil and you use animals intelligently in, in that process, those are the scenarios that, that uh, can theoretically be created. So just to summarize this amazing figure, um, reducing, so people saying that we need to reduce the livestock, that is a linear relationship with carbon emissions. So if we reduce by 50%, we're going to see a 50% in, in those emissions. However, that's not enough to overcome all of the other industrial ag practices that we are doing. So just seeing this 50% reduction, we're still in the positive, because if we sum all of these up, we're still positive. If we convert just 25% of our livestock into implementing adaptive multi-paddock grazing, AMP, 
we see it, it's not a linear relationship anymore. It's kind of more exponential. We see a lot more emissions of the net effect. So the net effect of the cattle being uh, grazed properly results in a negative emissions as shown here. And that can help offset some of the industrial cropping practices. And then if we move to 50% are being switched to adopt adaptive multi-paddock grazing, we can more than offset our anthropogenic emissions here from agriculture. And so this, this figure just really demonstrates the power of ruminants when managed properly can have negative emissions and offset all of the, the things that we're doing to kind of destroy the soil. So I, I just really appreciated this figure. And was there anything you wanted to highlight about figure two as well? So highlight two is the same kind of, of examination of the different alternatives, but here we include switching uh, to regenerative grazing, but also we know how to go to regenerative cropping. Mm -hmm. Rodale Institute and many people I work with around the world are already doing this. Gabe Brown is a great example. Mm -hmm. He has increased the amount of carbon in his soil on his cropping areas enormously by using um, soil friendly uh, management, reducing the, in eliminating tillage, greatly reducing uh, inorganic fertilizers and pesticides. So immediately you improve the, the function of the soil. So the greater the amount of regenerative grazing and the regenerative cropping um, you can incorporate, it gives you scenarios three, four, and five. So as soon as you hit three, just 25% of current agriculture switching to regenerative grazing and regenerative cropping, you are now putting more carbon in the ground via agriculture than you were, you were losing to the atmosphere. And four is a huge improvement on that. That's where we need to go. Yeah. And it's so much better for human health, as you mentioned in your opening dialogue. Yep. Yeah, I think, so just to, again, just hone in on this, the net effect would be the sum of the positive numbers with the negative. And you can see the power of regenerative cropping and grazing. We've spent a lot of this talk talking about regenerative grazing, but regenerative cropping systems is also this amazing pathway to improve the health of the soil as well. And as you've shown in this paper, just switching 25% of our current agriculture practices to implementing regenerative can more than offset any of the emissions that we create from agriculture practices. And it's almost just like, why, why wouldn't we do this? Why, why wouldn't we implement these, these practices? I think um, this is a really powerful paper. And just to make sure that you, this was you, you created these figures using the models that you all have generated from your observation, years of observation data. Well, we got a whole lot of people involved. You see the number. Right. And we got a bunch of engineers, uh, X from Shell, who really know how they're modeling very well. But I would like to bring in another very important point about this paper. Yeah. This paper is done by the, the Journal of the Soil and Water Conservation Society of North America. And I'm very glad that it's published here because this has got the vetting of the leading soil scientists in our nation, okay? There's no politics in that. This is actually the real deal. Yeah. If you go to some of these other politically uh, influenced uh, journals, um, uh, they probably wouldn't really like this stuff at all because it doesn't uh, paint in, in a, an unfavorable light the thing that they're trying to get rid of, i.e. livestock. Yeah, that, okay, so, so speaking of politics and research, um, something that I recognized in grad school as well is like funding source really matters. And so Dr. Teague, who is, who is funding your studies? <laughs> Well, I've been very fortunate. I've got quite a bit of government funding. Okay. Because the NRCS, to their credit, to their great credit, um, they pushed soil health as the lead thing they need to do. And they're still doing it, not quite as forcefully as they used to. But now we're getting science from those results. But uh, the, the most regular funding I've got is from a private uh, farming groups um, in the in the regenerative who, who practicing regenerative agriculture, who I've used uh, to do my research on, so they have provided the other funding, um, and 
obviously the people selling fertilizers and pesticides, they wouldn't even, I mean, they, they, they'd rather send me back to where I came from than actually support me. And you know that it's what drives the universities now is they have to survive economically and the only big money out there um, is really from those companies. But government funding, you know, NIFA and people like that, we've current on, on the basis of all the research that we've done with us. Now, the, the, the thing that's getting most funding from NIFA in agriculture or a high percentage is the stuff geared at what is improving soil health and working with the farmers to find out, you can't produce results for farmers. You've got to produce results with farmers. And that's the only way you're actually going to move things forward. Yeah, I think a lot of people um, who haven't done research, they don't really understand the amount of funds required. You've got to pay your grad students. You've got to pay for all the really expensive machinery and equipment that is required to take these data points out in the field. You've got to pay for being able to travel to these farms. You've got to pay yourself. And so it does require an enormous amount of funding. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I overheard you, or I heard you on another uh, interview talking about how McDonald's is actually funding some of your research. So because of the large amounts of research that you require, a lot of these, the government agencies uh, and universities, they require matching funds. And the industries that in agriculture that sell commodities like meat, et cetera, they have known that their businesses are in jeopardy unless they can paint a light or move things towards um, animal agriculture being much a more benign uh, impact on the land. And McDonald's are one of the first people who jumped in there and they funded us. I mean, they've been fantastic. And, and they're a worldwide organization. I mean, we've chatted with their folk right around the world, and they're currently expanding into Europe, Britain, France, uh, the Scandinavian countries, Australia. Um, and things are moving ahead quickly along, along these lines. That's, that's great to hear. Um, I think that it's, it's really interesting that some of these industries are changing their mindset um, and potentially interested in changing their practices a little bit faster and easier than some universities and curriculum development. Um, and I think, like you said, it's because they, they kind of see that their, their uh, work is potentially in jeopardy with all of the anti-meat um, information out there right now. So that's really great to hear that. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so you raise a very good point. But <clears throat> we know in the world that there are a whole lot of people who are making profits off the world population um, without being beneficial at all. And they're totally negative. This is not part of that. These people want to produce a product that is good for the land and good for people. So a significant part of our research is to show that it's a good for the land and good for the people. Yeah. In grazing ecosystems that evolved with grazers and the grass and stuff, they require animal presence or they cease to function the way they do. And they lose carbon. And there is abundant res, uh, results from geologists. Uh, I quote uh, Greg Retallick in that paper that you quoted. He's done the most fantastic work showing how the grasslands evolved and changed from very low productive ecosystems into carbon high, very productive ecosystems due to the, the uh, evolved diverse um, large mammals and uh, predators and things like that. So th there's a precedent and, and we've got to return to those fertile soils by mimicking nature. There's, there's nothing that we know that can do that as adequately. So all these other things, this producing fake burgers, um, you know, what they do is it's plants. So what do they do? I sent you that article today, which shows a picture of a bare soil Due to arable cropping, compared to the um, the alternative of having it under permanent grassland um, most of the time to build the carbon. As soon as you plow and and you have bare ground, all your carbon's gone. It's up in the atmosphere, and all the bad things, the the the, the poor soil, the poor uh, water quality that comes off the erosion and stuff, is rampant. As soon as you don't have permanent cover of the ground, we know how to plant plant crops and grow crops fantastically well under a, just sowing them into, into existing 
uh, sod from grasses that has been managed well. So we know how to do this stuff. We just got to move people in that direction. Yeah, that that is, I think, one of the, the biggest challenges. Um, and that's a, another question for you. How do we get there? Where, where do we go from here? How do we get these practices more readily adopted? I think, um, like you mentioned, it takes years to see these improvements in the soil. And a lot of farmers need to be able to pay their paycheck from year to year. And it, I think that it is kind of an expensive transition for the short term to get into these type of um, practices. So do you believe there could potentially be policy change to help support farmers transition or to incentivize them to adopt these practices? Well, there's, there's people who know that subject better than I do working on it. And what they're trying to do is, is develop a payment for carbon credits, um, which uh, has, you know, there's two edges to a sword. Um, but it, we've got to work in that direction. But it, it's the biggest um, limiting factor is what's between people's ears. We have to indicate to them that there is a better way and the huge advantage is to moving in that direction. And that's why we've moved across to getting um, uh, uh, films made of people who've made the transition and, and what they like about it and, and using that as a base to change people's minds. So go to the Carbon Cowboys and follow what's coming up fairly shortly um, uh, to actually strengthen that. And you will see that there are a lot of people who are making a good turn of this and uh, they wouldn't go back. They absolutely wouldn't go back. Yeah, I think education and sharing stories like the success stories is incredibly powerful. Um, and I like how, I don't know, the word is getting out there. Like Dave Brown presented in front of Congress after one of the congressmen watched Kiss the Ground. Like, how cool is that? Um, so I, I think I really agree. And that's what my sister and I hope to do is share a little bit more about this. Yeah. So the other big thing here is that it's no secret in agriculture, the last 10 years, farmers are going broke at an increasing rate because they, they have to increase their inputs mm -hmm. because the inputs are, are decreasing their soil function. And they, it's, just, it's just a downhill pit that they're digging for themselves. And they've realized this. They cannot afford to buy these things. Yeah. That's why the experiences of Gabe Brown, who actually was in the same position and he actually found a way of using biology that cost almost nothing uh, was the, the secret to actually building it up again. And the, the, if you can't learn from what's happening now, um, uh, you're not going to be on the map anymore. That's a great point. Simple as that. Yeah. I do want to get your perspective. You've, you've been in the uh, research space in the AMP grazing for a number of years and um, yes, you are retiring. You've made an incredible impact to the field. So thank you for all of your work. What are you excited about for the next generation of researchers? What are the, what are the remaining challenges you think they should be um, addressing with future research studies? Hmm. I mentioned to you earlier, the, the research sequence mm -hmm. is to find out what improvements have been made and then to better understand those. And how do the different circumstances, i.e. Um, geological, um, soil-wise, climate-wise, and management-wise require in each of those locations? So that, that's just more detail in, in that, that, that arena. Um, I am not retiring. I've got away from a &M University. Okay. okay. So my kids are really interested in this. Both of them, all three of them are uh, Aggies. That's awesome. Um, so I've just bought a, a farm that has depleted soil. We're putting down mixed cover crops to get it back in. And then I'm going to, when at the necessary time, bring in under holistic management, first cattle to get the grasses sorted out and then bring in sheep. And I believe you know something about sheep. Um, well, I, we're, getting some, we're getting some sheep here soon. Um, but you, so you're going to get some dorpers? Well, I'll crossbreed with dorpers. I'll, I'll get um, the, the hair sheep that actually handle parasites more. Very but nice. then the market wants to have a little bit of a blackhead. 
Yeah. Over and above that, yeah. Yeah. Where are you based? We're in Southwest Michigan. So it's very similar to you. So we have 22 acres that's been conventional corn and soy crop rotation for, I don't know, decades. And so less than a percent soil organic matter, more like 0.5. So we're starting from ground zero. Um, and my sister and I bought it last year. And so we uh, did some diverse cover crop seeding just a few weeks ago. Um, we're gonna get lamb out there in July because there, we should have a lot of weed, which I like to just, it, it's weeds are good and yeah. lamb like weeds. And so we're gonna have a lot of weeds and hopefully some of those cover crops will come up. Um, so it's just gonna be a few years of hay bombing during the winter, cover crop seeding and getting those lamb rotated in. And I'm gonna implement AMP as much as I can. It's only 22 acres. So my paddocks are gonna be really small. So that way I leave time for ample recovery between, but it sounds like we're at similar time scales in terms of our field recovery. You put ahead of me. So you look awfully like the young lady called the shepherdess on the YouTube. Oh no, hopefully one day, hopefully one day I will. <laughs> you certainly are lookalikes, yeah. <laughs> Doing the same thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well cool. Um, I'm excited to keep in touch and learn from your progress in your fields as well. Um, and okay, one remaining question I ask everyone that comes on the channel, out of any, any animal, any part of the animal, what is your favorite cut? So my sister and I are huge proponents of nose to tail eating for sustainability reasons, for nutrient acquisition reasons, and it just tastes amazing. So what is your, it can be anything is fair game. Well, beef is one of my favorites. Um, I would go a long way to having a, um, a rolled prime rib roast with Yorkshire pudding and Brussels sprouts and roast potatoes. Now that's my English background. It's you could, you could lure me anywhere with that. That sounds great. That mm -hmm. sounds great. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Teague, so much for hopping on the channel. Um, I, you shared so much great information and thank you for all of your work in demonstrating that amp grazing and ruminants when managed properly are a vital, vital part of repairing our ecosystems. I'm very glad that you young folk are on board. There's so many of you who are really wise and I think you're gonna change the landscape radically. Thanks for what you do. Well, thank you. How awesome is Dr. Teague? Make sure you guys check out all of his research publications in Google Scholar. You can just search Dr. Richard Teague. I have them all saved in a Mendeley folder and I've read pretty much all of them. They're all great pieces of work. So make sure you guys be on the lookout for part two where Dr. Teague will respond to some common criticisms of regenerative agriculture practices. So until our next video, guys, make sure you are behaving like a angel.